Welcome to our Portions Podcast, where we discuss the portions of Scripture that are being read in the synagogues around the world each and every week. The goal and desire of these podcasts are that you would not only learn and be encouraged by the Scripture, but also that your heart would be enlarged where Israel and the Jewish people are concerned. So I ask you to open your Bible and open your heart, and I pray that over the course of the next 20 minutes, that the God of Israel would meet us as we study His Word together. Welcome, friends, to our Together for Israel Portions podcast, where each week we are so excited to have a very, very special guest with us as we talk about the portions of Scripture that are being read in synagogues around the world. And today, like last week, our guest is uh, one of my dearest friends, Paul Wilbur. Paul, thank you so much for joining us again this week. Oh, yeah, it's a real pleasure. Thank you, Scott. Uh, It's awesome having you. And we talked last week, and friends, I encourage you, if you didn't listen to last week's podcast, you can go back because it really sets the stage for what we're going to talk about this week. Last week, we talked a little bit about Jacob and uh, the dream that he had and the place that he left and the way that he communicated with God. And this week, I'm really excited to have Paul back because it's a continuation of where we left off. Paul, this week's um, portion begins in Genesis chapter 32, verse 4, all the way through Genesis 36, verse 43. And the name of this week's portion, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is Ve'eshlach, or and he sent. And we know after reading this, that it's talking about Jacob sending messengers to greet Esau because something has happened and Jacob is uh, a little bit terrified about coming face to face with the brother of whom he took the birthright. Why don't we just start off from there and, uh, and, and tell us what you think? Yeah, well, last week we were talking about... Uh, Jacob's um, uh, escape, really, from Beersheba, where where they had been set up and digging wells, and and he decides because his brother says, I guess out loud, the scriptures say, he said to himself, but somehow it gets back to his mama, <laughs> and you know, mamas mamas ain't gonna lie, so she goes to she goes to Jacob, <laughs> and she says, you you better pack your bag, so he heads back heads off to Haran. Now, that's not a small journey. I mean, you look on the map, and they're living in Beersheba down at the southern end of the Dead Sea, Mm -hmm. and that's uh, somewhere halfway between the the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, about halfway, at least according to my my eye on the map. And he's heading to Haran, or Haran, which is up in the the southern end of, of Turkey, up by the the headwaters of the Euphrates River, and and that's a pretty good uh, yeah. schlep. But he's <laughs> determined he he needs to he needs to get out of Dodge because his his brother just got a shiny new pistol and he means to <laughs> use it. Yeah. So he gets up there in in last week's readings. He gets up there. He increases. He he finds uh, that he's he's got um, he's got a relative up there by the name of Laban. Uh, he falls in love with the, Rebecca, the youngest daughter. He gets tricked after working for, for his uncle for seven years. And some, somehow he sleeps with Leah, the, the older daughter, and doesn't even know it till the morning. Yeah, I think you, I meant, guess, you said Rebecca, but you did mean Rachel. I just wanted to sorry, clarify. Rachel. No, that's great. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. And um, And so... After another week, Laban says, okay, all right, all right, I tricked you, but, you know, we can't give away the younger daughter before the older. So he says, you know, spend the rest of your your marriage week with Leah. I'll give you the love of your life as well. Uh, he increases, he stays, he yes. works, he leaves, he runs, and now he's on, he's on the run again. And there in chapter 32... He's preparing to meet his brother Esau. Um, 
and he wants to make peace. So he, he leaves his family by a well, and he heads out to, to meet his brother. Now, the night before, uh, let's pick up the reading here in Genesis 32. Genesis, the Hebrew um, word is Bereshit, uh, beginnings. Yeah. And so let's let's start reading just a small portion here in verse 22 of chapter 32. Mm-hmm. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, hello, <laughs> and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. He's not sure if he's going to live or die. Yeah. But for some reason, it's important to him to make peace with his brother. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him, this is at night now, until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. These are these are strange things <laughs> as, as we're reading. I mean, who who is this man yeah. that comes and wrestles? Is, is this a dream? Is it an actual wrestling match? Is this a supernatural being? Then the man says, let me go, for it is daybreak. I mean, it's... Um, I, I won't go to, to the dark side, but, yeah. you know, sunlight <laughs> um, is bad for uh, demons and stuff. Yeah. But Jacob replies, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Somehow, Jacob has authority over this supernatural being. Mm. He's got a hold of him. He's wrestled. This supernatural being has some authority over him. Because he touches his hip, and um, and so that's why older Jews always have hip replacements, except <laughs> except us, except, except us. us. Yes, they, yes, yes. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it's 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 a very unusual situation. But let's let's read on. And so Jacob says, "I won't let you go unless you bless me." The man asked him, "What is your name?" <laughs> he comes, he's wrestling with a guy all night and yeah. doesn't know his name. <laughs> Jacob, he answered, or usurper, or I'm the guy who grabbed at the heel of my brother. And then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, which means a prince with God. Mm. Prince with God. Your name will be Prince with God, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please let, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel. Peniel is face of God. You know, the, the Yiddish word that we use quite a bit is punim. Punim, right. Uh, Speaking about face, so Peniel is the face of God, saying it's because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, as he was limping because of his hip. Hmm. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Hmm. Now, I don't know that when I'm out at a steak restaurant, if I inquire, um, is, is this from the hip? I don't, I just want to make sure that it's good. Oh. Um, you're, so, you're such we, a good Jewish boy, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> until, it, until, until it comes to other items on the menu, then I just close my eyes. But <laughs> This wrestling match is crazy. Bro, this wrestling match is crazy if you think about it because, mm-hmm. well, if, if this dude is an angel, and we know he is, how mm-hmm. is it that an angel wouldn't whoop up in a wrestling match? I mean, mm-hmm. there's no way that an aged man could wrestle all night. I mean, if I'm wrestling like 10 minutes, I'm ready, I'm ready to pass out, but here you got a guy who's who's advanced in years he's already got his 11 sons and mm-hmm. he's wrestling with an angel and he's 
he's somehow being allowed to stay in the match, so to speak. Mm-hmm. What do you think mm-hmm. is really going on here? Well, there's a there's a shift happening. And isn't it interesting that when God wants to communicate with us, he has to reduce himself wow. because of his great glory. Wow. So as as much as you know, with with the with the choosing my words very carefully, we we know that Yeshua laid down his glory. Yes. And he took on flesh in a sense. God reduced himself wow. to live inside of, of this earth creature, you know, that that we call Homo sapien, that this this small tabernacle wow. of skin and bone. And he reduced himself in order to demonstrate how we are to worship, how we're to live, how we're to, to love one another. He said, do what I do. So Jesus, Yeshua, is God reduced. Wow. Um, and and I think this is what we see here. I love it, bro. That is so awesome. And it so speaks of the humility of God himself, who Isn't that incredible? loves us and his people so much to allow himself, allow himself to almost get beat. I mean, bro, if one of my kids beat me in a wrestling match, <laughs> I mean, I'd hear about it the rest of my life. But the Lord himself, <laughs> the Lord himself, I love how you put that. He has to reduce himself in mm-hmm. order to communicate with us. And friends, if that's not a picture of the ultimate love of God, not only for mm-hmm. the nation of Israel, but, but, but it speaks also for what will God not do in order to reveal himself to man. That's so good, bro. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that was, I, no, I really no. felt like that was brilliant, man. Well, I, here again, these are these are things, you know, as we spoke about last week, and maybe we talked about it off the air, that there's just, that, that when you begin to consider the word, the scriptures, yeah. um, and, and you begin to meditate on them and speak of them, um, there's a stirring in the spirit that God wants us to know. Yeah. He wants us to understand. And and so these these are not thoughts that I've thought before, but there's something about you see in the in the in the yeshiva, where when young Jewish boys uh, come to study the Torah, mm. or or most of the time the the writings of the rabbis, they sit two by two, and they'll take a, a portion. And they begin to they'll read it and discuss it. They'll take a position, then they'll change the position and begin to look at these things from different viewpoints. Yeah. And it stirs up understanding for us that is so good for us. This is a time, I believe, uh, Acts chapter 3, I think it's verse 21, without looking at it, where Peter says, that uh, after after giving his his famous declaration there, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did our leaders. The prophets told us that the Messiah had to suffer, which was a huge revelation for Israel. Never wanted a suffering Messiah, always looking for the next King David that's going to throw the bums out, yeah. establish the, the, the kingdom in Jerusalem. In fact, that was their question to Yeshua in Acts 1, when they're standing on the Mount of Olives, where we were just a couple months ago, looking at that very spot. Yes. For those who are listening to us today and missed that beautiful recording, Roar from Zion, which they can now, as you'll say in just a couple minutes, pre-order yeah. at paulwilber.com or wilberministries.com. But he says in Acts 3, Peter says in Acts 3, he must remain in heaven until, hmm. until the time to restore all things. Now, I have run this across the the scope of Dr. Michael L. Brown, who I, uh, you and I respect as one of the leading scholars uh, of scripture today. And, and he agrees with me. I believe we have entered the time of all things being restored, the restoring of the word of God to the people of God mm-hmm. with revelation. Mm-hmm. So that we're, we're saying this is, this is not a messianic Jewish thing. This is not a church thing. Yeah. We have now entered a time of a kingdom thing. Wow. 
where he's restoring the kingdom I love it in our day and in a spe- Jew and Gentile one new man Ephesians 2 Ephesians 3 that, that we are built this what we're standing on is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and God is in the business today of restoring these things to us and we should just expect as we pick up the word and begin to read that it, it's the light of life the light comes into yeah. us we understand on a, on a greater level and therefore we act on a greater level this is the the days of elijah I that'd love, be a good song uh yeah that would be, that a, good would be a good song <laughs> hey let, I, think I, I'll write I think you should write it um hey uh, i uh, i was just reminded of two scriptures as you were speaking psalm 113 mm-hmm. Five says, who is like the Lord our God who's enthroned on high, who mm-hmm. humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? And then just one more, Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, and this is to your point, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. So as we're looking at Jacob, there's something so attractive to him in God's eyes, and it's not his, his, his manliness, it's not his uh, physical acumen. It's not something that even maybe earthly man would choose. But here you have the one who is enthroned on high wrestling with this dude all night and humbles himself. Why? Because he wants to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Isaiah 57, 15. Mm-hmm. Bro, I've never seen that before, but um, I just, I think you're really touching on something that really is an encouragement to us who may not even feel like we have it all together because God's not attracted to those people. He's attracted to those who really need him. And Jacob needed him in a huge way, not only for his Mm -hmm. own life, but he's about to face uh, an elder brother, so to speak, uh, Mm -hmm. who he kind of really took advantage of and, 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 God reveals himself and changes his name. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Anyway, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be you talking more than me, but I just, I kind of interrupted you, but I am so, uh, I'm, I'm really moved, bro. Your term, yeah. he, he has to reduce himself. And for the mm. purpose of that whole restorative thing that you talk about from the book of Acts, it all really comes together. Anyway, bro, we've got about, mm. we've got about four minutes. I'm gonna let you talk. Well, um, because uh, this is not a recording that I can go back to, and because I want to include this in the blog when I when I actually write it, that, those verses that man that that is so good. Psalm one thirteen, where? It's Psalm one thirteen, verses five and six. Okay, and Isaiah fifty seven fifteen. Isaiah fifty seven fifteen. Yeah. Okay. That's so that's so good. And and listen to this as you were speaking. Now I'm I'm thinking what triggers the humility of God. See because this is a covenant. And and it's a two-way street. It's it's not a you know it's always you see in the scriptures God saying if you then I. Yeah. If you will humble yeah. yourself and pray, then I will hear from heaven. If you will choose me, then I will be your God. Mm. Um Exodus chapter uh, 19 and and chapter 20 the the 10 commandments and there's always the if you then i and so we see here uh jacob for maybe i, I don't know I, i'm i'm not his judge maybe for the first time in his life humbling himself he he has a large uh army with him mm. he's got his wives and and their servants and all of his children and all of his possessions he could have done the thanksgiving turkey thing you know stand on the hill and puff himself up as big as he could possibly be and say to his brother so you want to you want to bring it well okay you know look how big i am but instead he removes all of his stuff 
he humbles himself. Yeah. He comes across the river all by himself, and wow. he's going to stand there and beg his brother's forgiveness wow. and seek um, to be restored, recognizing that he was the one who was at fault. And what it does, in my mind, is it triggers the the fathering humility of God who says, okay, if you're going to humble yourself, then I'm going to reduce myself and I'm going to show you who I am. Yeah. I'm going to change your name from the one that your brother used to know to the one who now has a relationship with God. So and good. I am going to be your rear guard and even a thousand fall at this side and 10,000 another. It will not come near your tents because I am now your glory, not your own strength, not your wittiness, not what you can conjure up, but I am your lawyer. I'm your advocate and I will make peace between the two because you will humble yourself. Humility, I'm seeing Scott for years now, is the first step towards anything yeah. of God, anything of God. If, if we need just salvation, we don't come to him proud saying, uh, because I've been such a good guy, I, I you can give me the blood of your son. Yeah. Or if I need healing, because I've been such a good person, you know, I gave, uh, I gave at church a couple of years ago when they needed something, you owe it to me. No. <laughs> First, you take on the garments of humility, and we approach a king with humility wait to hear what he has to say oh my god and he responds to humility I that's love... and that's the center of worship that is worship in a nutshell i love that paul this has been so good i'm uh, just in closing i want to give one verse that i never linked really with this portion either but in matthew eleven twenty eight, when yeshua says come to me all who are weary and heavy laden which i think is, I mean, I don't think necessarily he's referring to Jacob here, but Jacob had, had a pretty heavy burden on him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you shalom. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls." Bro, God showed his humility to Jacob and taught him that he would wrestle with him and reduce himself. Jacob then humbly goes because of God's humility that, that, that came first. Jacob then goes humbly to his brother and not only is the meeting peaceable, but he finds peace and shalom. Maybe just in closing, literally, bro, in, in, in a minute, can you just give the essence of the Hebrew word shalom and then just pray for those who are listening as mm. we close? Mm. Yeah, for sure. The, the essence of the word shalom, and some of us have heard this before, is not just um, the lack of strife, right? but it is the presence of, it's not the lack of something, it's the presence of someone. Yeah, wow, good. It's not the, it's not the lack of strife, it's the presence of Sar Shalom, the Prince yeah. of Peace. So good. What is the name of Yeshua Himself? So let me let me pray this over you. Yes. Numbers chapter six, the Lord says to to Moses and to Aaron says, "When you speak over my people, speak these words." And He said, "When you do, I will do two things. One, I will." put my name mm. on the people and you can one of his names is sar shalom if you need peace today then take the name sar shalom for your life when i declare these words and he said i will bless them yeah the blessing of the lord that makes you rich adds no sorrow to it the blessing of the lord that that no curse can remove mm. all right here it comes yeah the lord bless you and keep you. Yavarechacha Adonai Vayishmarecha. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Ya'er Adonai Panavelecha Vichunecha. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you his shalom. Yisa Adonai panavelecha veyesem lecha shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach Sar Shalom in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, who is himself the Prince of all peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast today. For more information about Together for Israel and the work that we're doing in the land of Israel, please visit our website at www.togetherforisrael.org. We look forward to you joining with us next week on another Portions Podcast.